Dimirovic, ich bin hier Senior Fellow bei der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung, in deren Namen ich jetzt euch auch begrüße zu dieser Veranstaltung. Eine weitere Vorstellung eines Buches, das neue Buch von Michael Hart und Toni Negri, was ja auf Deutsch erschienen ist, ähm, jetzt gerade vor, vor einigen Wochen. Ja, also ähm, insofern, also näher dran, okay, also eine, eine Diskussion über dieses neue Buch und wenn ich richtig sehe, der vierte Teil ja, der der Serie von Analysen, die mit Empire angefangen hat. Ich möchte euch auch begrüßen, ich hoffe und ich denke, das ist auch für viele der Anlass, ähm, dann an der Marx-Konferenz weiter teilzunehmen. Das ist ja hier sozusagen eine lockere Eröffnung dieser Marx-Konferenz, die ja dann morgen beginnen wird, ab mittags 13 Uhr mit den Workshops und deren richtige, wenn man so will, was da richtig ist, eine Eröffnung dann am Abend stattfindet. Ich will ein, also nur ganz kurz jetzt hier was sagen, weil es ist uns wichtig, dass ihr das im Blick habt. Wir haben sehr, sehr viele Anmeldungen. Wir haben mit diesem, mit diesem Zuspruch für diese Konferenz in dem Umfang nicht gerechnet. Das bedeutet, dass die Räume der Stiftung für diese Zahl der Anmeldungen und vermutlichen Besucherinnen wahrscheinlich immer wieder zu Engpässen führt, bei den Möglichkeiten, in die Räume zu gelangen. Wir müssen das natürlich aus technischen, feuerpolizeilichen, versicherungsrechtlichen Gründen, müssen wir das bedenken und haben die Bitte an euch, dass ihr wirklich da euch auch ein bisschen in Geduld übt, was den Umgang mit, dieser, mit den Zugangsmöglichkeiten zu den Räumen anbelangt. Ähm, last und not least, ja, möchte ich gerne auch hier die Gelegenheit ergreifen, an einen sehr, sehr guten Freund, einen Genossen, einen bedeutenden Marxisten für uns in Deutschland, in Westdeutschland erinnern, Elmar Altvater, der gestern nach langer Krankheit verstorben ist ähm, und der für uns auch in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung und in der Partei Die Linke eine bedeutsame Funktion hatte als Ratgeber, als Analytiker mit seinen Analysen zur Globalisierung, zum Finanzmarktkapitalismus eine wichtige und bedeutende Rolle gespielt hat, auch für einige von uns oder jedenfalls für mich und einige andere, die hier im Raum sind, auch für uns im Zusammenhang der zivilgesellschaftlichen Aktivitäten der Neuen Linken, seit den 60er und 70er Jahren im sozialistischen Büro und dann zuletzt auch bei, bei ATTAC im wissenschaftlichen Beirat. Also das möchte ich gerne hier einfach zur Erinnerung noch sagen. Das ist vielleicht für viele, die jetzt von weit kommen und mit der deutschen Linken nicht so vertraut sind, vielleicht nicht so, aber dennoch ist es ein wichtiger Bezugspunkt für unsere Debatten. Vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit und dann gebe ich das jetzt an Lars weiter, der die Moderation übernimmt. Danke. Okay, ich werde jetzt mal ins Englische gehen. Thanks Alex uh, for the presentation. My name is Lars Stubbe. I um, am the substitute for my colleague uh, Thomas Atzert, who is actually the interpreter and the translator of uh, virtually all of your works, as far as I understand. Unfortunately, he has, he's had an accident just a couple of days ago, and of course, we wish him all the best from here. Uh, and I just stepped in. Tonight's presentation with uh, Michael will be about his latest book, as Alex has already mentioned, and I will just briefly present you the, the way the night is thought and uh, is, is, is conceived uh, for you to have an idea on uh, what's going to follow uh, tonight. Uh, first of all, we, I'll briefly present uh, uh, Michael and of course uh, uh, Antonio's work. Um, we'll then have uh, round about three quarters of an hour of a presentation by Michael on the central tenets of his work, on the central questions that he engages with and uh, we'll then Uh, start off with an introductory question and after that we'll have uh, an opportunity for the floor to step in with questions so 
take good notes and think clearly about what is being said so as you can engage afterwards fully within this utmost important discussion, I would say. Um, briefly, I think even though most people will surely have heard about Michael and about Antonio, it's nevertheless a good cost custom to briefly introduce the presenters and uh, I will try to give a very brief overview over what they've been doing. So, Michael, he is uh, not only uh, 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 a renowned uh, translator of uh, some of Antonio Negri's books, but he's now working as professor for literature at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And since 1994, he's been there. And together with uh, Antonio Negri, who, is, um, who was born in 1933, was a professor for the theory of the state at the University of Padua in uh, early years and was a co-founder of Potere Operaio in 1969, uh, after which he was then um, imprisoned by the Italian state in 1979 for trumped-up political um, allegations. In 1983, he was able to exile himself in France, from whence he returned back in 1979 to 19, 1997 to Italy and was released in 2003 and has been collaborating on a number of works together with Michael. So the works are usually uh, are quite known. I will just first of all briefly say something on the importance of that work and I think the importance rests very much rests very, very much within in actualization not only of Marxist thought in general but also of taking up the uh, operaist traditions within much of what uh, was a decisive moment in uh, European uh, post-war history of the labor movement, out of which I would briefly just mark the three tenets that I consider are vital and continue to be of utmost importance unto this very day. First of all, there is the conception that was developed within operaism of the new constitution, of the reconstitution of the working class. So uh, rather than seeing the working class as a continuous homogeneous unit, it is something that is constantly reconstituted and also uh, working on its own new composition. Secondly, the inversion of thought. It is not capital which comes first, uh, but it is the working class, it is the proletariat. This inversion making it possible to look into the possibilities that the multitude or that other um, forces can actually obtain and try to do away with capitalism. And finally, of course, to look at the tendencies that are prevalent in each different phase or each different development of capital and to try and situate oneself in these tendencies and to look for those cracks that are opening for political discussion. These, I would argue, these three points have been taken up time and again in the different works such as Empire, which was published in 2000 and uh, generally can be said to be an analysis of the new sovereign Multitude, published in 2004, is in large parts, to a certain degree, a reconsideration of the reconstitution of that, what might be called the proletariat, in its new guise, in the form of the multitude, on which uh, Michael will surely also say something. Commonwealth, then, published in 2009, was uh, mainly focusing on the biopolitical constitution of the common and finally now we are here to hear from Michael Assembly Assembly your new work in which you focus on the political questions without uh, posing the political that are vital for us without further ado I would uh, simply like to say that of course this brief introduction is just meant to give you a very brief hint of the breadth of the work that is not only rich in its historical uh, considerations but also in the references both to the 
uh, tradition of European uh, political and philosophical thought, but also to the concrete struggles that have been waged in the centuries gone by and in current times. And with these words, I would like to hand over to Michael. Thanks. Uh, thanks especially to Lars, uh, not only for, for moderating, but stepping in uh, for Thomas, I really appreciate it. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, at the beginning uh, Mario and the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for the Herculean efforts of organizing the event that will profit from the next few days, which seems to me um, really promising. I, I'm also um, very pleased to be here. I, the, 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 even this site holds a special memory for me when I believe it was 2004 when the German edition of Empire came out. Uh, coming here for a discussion was really both um, challenging and really transformative for me. So um, I'm appreciative of that in all, in all regards. I, I wanted to uh, start saying that, that Tony and I started working on this book really with the questions that were open for us by the various movements in 2011. Movements that continued from 2011, 2013, 2014. The so-called uh, leaderless movements, uh, starting in Tunisia and Egypt, um, you know, even in late 2010, 2011, continuing across the Mediterranean uh, in Spain in May of that year in 2011, in Greece, uh, finally crossing the Atlantic for uh, Occupy by September in Zuccotti Park, various other occupies. I consider in that same line also the uh, the Gezi Park protests in 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 Turkey. In some way, the Brazilian protests of that same year, 2013. Black Lives Matter in the U.S. has a has somewhat different formation, but in some ways continues. I think with this question. And so, for us, both the excitement uh, and the inspiration of these movements but also the questions they raise. Very simple question, which I think maybe all of us would share, which is why have these movements, which express the needs and desires of so many, not been able to achieve lasting change and the more just society that they're, that they're seeking? And you know, when I started, so the last, the, for the last year I've been presenting this book, or I arranged a number of book presentations in the US of this book, which were really just excuses to have political discussions uh, at anarchist bookstores, at arts collectives, in universities, etc. And I learned many things from them, and maybe I'll try to explain to you some of them uh, today. But when, uh, when I started doing this, the first one I, I did was in an anarchist bookstore in Baltimore, a really fantastic place, and I thought, after the election of Trump, that what was needed to talk about now was resistance and different forms of resistance and that I, I shouldn't or it didn't seem as perhaps as pressing for the audience to talk about leadership and the question of these movements. And it was interesting to me that the audience afterwards were saying, no, Michael, actually now more than ever, we need to pose this question of leadership and organization in the movements. That in fact, um, the question takes on more urgency with the rise of right-wing movements and governments. Like clearly we need to protest, but protest is not enough. We need also to create real alternatives and that in fact the movements are central to that. So that's what I, I, I thought, I'll, I'll try to work through briefly this framing of the issue in part in terms of leadership. At least that's a pretext for it. I mean, so Tony and I started, yeah, what, what would you say? This is in some ways a rhetorical question um, that we pose, where have all the leaders gone? In some ways, where, where have that, uh, those figures that had been central to revolutionary and liberation movements for the last hundred years on the left, where have they gone and, 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 and what has taken their place, you might say? So the first obvious answer, in some ways this is clearing the ground in a way for thinking about it. You know, and so the question is, yeah, who are the new or where are the new Martin Luther Kings or Rudy Duchkas or Steve Bikos? Like where have all the leaders gone in that sense? There's a first simple answer, which is worth saying right away, uh, which is that they're all either dead or in prison. I mean that there's a, a, there's a long-standing uh, tactic, uh, anti-revolutionary tactic, um, that has 
created a, a, a wide variety of weapons of repression, not only uh, targeted assassination, but also legal persecution, entrapment, media campaigns, even turning leaders into celebrities in order to co-opt them, criminalizing protests in a variety of ways. And, and you can, from any country, I think, create a pantheon of these leaders who have been destroyed, Rosa Luxemburg herself, Antonio Gramsci, Che Guevara, Fred Hampton, Nelson Mandela, Ibrahim Kapakaya, you go on and on, I think, in each country that I don't know, I'm sure you could. With a, they're all, it, this is really with the, the, the counterinsurgency strategy that if you, with the idea that if you cut off the head, then the body will die. So that seems to me the simple answer is it's, it's worth staying at, even though I think it's the, the, the least interesting answer for us. The more profound answer, which I think starts leading to, um, to a, a path, is to recognize that these, this position of leadership, not those people in particular, but that position of leadership has in fact undergone internal attacks in the movements in the last 50 years. Um, in fact, and I think for very good reasons, that leadership has been critiqued in the name of anti-authoritarianism, in the name of democracy. I would say in each of the major movements of the last 50 years, uh, feminist movements, anti-racist movements, student movements, uh, labor movements, that, the, that uh, centralized decision-making and the centralized position of leadership, at least in its traditional form, has been undermined. For me, at least in the US context, uh, the feminist movements of the 1960s and 70s and 80s were emblematic, but like I say, no different from the others really, uh, with developing practices to undermine the centralization of decision-making and sense the centralization of leadership. Uh, practices, simple practices like consciousness raising groups, uh, making sure that everyone speaks at meetings, uh, prohibiting anyone from speaking in the name of the group to the media. These are things that have now, I think, become, uh, in, in each national context, uh, generalized. Again, in the US context, this is, it, it at least helps me move forward, that, those who lament the decline of leadership, uh, for instance, those who critique Black Lives Matter in the name of leadership, they point to the his history of African American politics as a counterexample of successes due to a series of charismatic leaders, again, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Huey Newton, there's a long line of male uh, charismatic leaders that were, that are thought to have been uh, the, nece the necessary uh, foundation for successful um, political movements. But all along, there's also been a minor line within African American politics, often associated with black feminist thought, that has questioned that position of the charismatic leader. Question that position uh, at least on two or maybe three grounds. In fact, let me read you, this is a quote by uh, a contemporary um, black feminist writer, uh, Erica Edwards is her name, but that's the, it's the content that matters for you, which is, uh, she says, the default deployment of charismatic leadership as a political wish, that is the lament that we have no leaders, and as a narrative explanatory mechanism that is the telling of the story of black politics as a story of black leadership is as politically dangerous as it is historically inaccurate. Yeah, so that second point might be useful. I mean, I, and I think it's not true only about African-American politics, which is that there is an historical inaccuracy of recognizing the political successes of movements only as successes of that leadership you know, where the history of black politics, this is what she's lamenting, gets told as the success of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, the figures I mentioned earlier. So there's an historical inaccuracy, but she's also saying it's a political danger. Um, and that's what I think the movements have been working towards. Uh, the political danger of the undemocratic nature of centralized decision making. I, I read, uh, or it's very easy to read, I think, Black Lives Matter, as a manifestation of how developed the immune system of the movements have become against leadership. 
I'm not really good at biology, but I, I, I at least think I understand that the way the immune system works is having kind of antibodies, and I think that's the way the movements function now. That any, any um, appearance of a kind of condensation of, political, of centralized political decision making, of leadership in that sense, is immediately attacked. You might say for better or for worse, but I think that's the reality of the movements today. And I think also for good reasons. Black Lives Matter is consciously re rejecting the charismatic male leadership model, rejecting it, like I said, as both undemocratic and as ineffective. Rather, what's been deployed by Black Lives Matter, instead of leaders, are sometimes facilitators who sometimes choreograph action via social media, but without centralized decision making. I, I'm not presenting Black Lives Matter as if it's the new model that we should all follow. It's rather, I would say, one of many fields of experimentation uh, with new modes or with new organizational forms. That's what, am I doing okay? Okay, you can hear me in the back, right? I'm talking, okay, you were that. And the translators aren't objecting yet. They're, they're saying, okay, pardon? Okay, slower, okay. Closer, closer, not slower, okay. So, so Tony and I, let me just uh, it, it, it summarize that in a way. Tony and I are, um, we are, of course, endorsing, I think as most would, we're endorsing critiques of authority and we're endorsing demands for democracy in the movements. But on the one hand, we think that it's not sufficient merely to critique leadership in its traditional forms. And especially when that critique of leadership is translated into a refusal of organization and institution. So that in, in one sense we think, we think is insufficient the pure horizontality that has developed at least in the, in the thinking of many movements. On the other hand, it seems to, it seems to me completely um, unrealistic, let's put it that way, uh, it to imagine that we could return to old centralized forms of leadership, charismatic or not vanguard party or not. Um, so I guess our point, maybe this is the starting point of our thinking, is that those aren't our only two choices. Like the two choices are not either a complete uh, horizontality or a return to old, old forms, old forms of leadership. In fact, what, what Tony and I propose, but this is just as a, as a, um, as a point of, it's just as a framework, not really as a solution. What we propose is something that that, that we take from something that Mario Tronti wrote in the mid-1960s, but we try to develop it differently, which is an inversion of strategy and tactics. An inversion of strategy and tactics as a framework for addressing the problem of organization. Yeah, there you go. Um, what I mean primarily is this. So, uh, I am, I'm understanding strategy as a kind of a way of understanding leadership. Strategy here is is the, the ability, in the simplest terms, the, the, the ability, the, the capacity, the, the role to um, make decisions about the most important uh, uh, questions, enable the ability to gauge the entire, to entire social field in order to ensure continuity to make long-term plans. Whereas tactics, tactics is the domain really of limited decision-making, um, short-term plans often divided in the, in the tradition between party and trade unions, party as the, as the one responsible for strategy, trade unions for tactics. But I think in all of the um, revolutionary and liberation movements of the mid 20th century, the early and mid 20th century, this dynamic of strategy and tactics between leadership and uh, rank and file have been deployed. The, with the assumption that only the leaders have the knowledge, the intelligence, the vision necessary for strategic planning because most people's vision is only local and limited. So our, the question here, maybe another rhetorical question, what if these capacities were becoming generalized or could be generalized? Maybe that's a better way of saying. What if democratic movements were able to make effective decisions and long-term plans? So this is not a, a, a proposal for the elimination of leadership, but rather a reversal of the roles. In other words, that strategy should be the responsibility of the movements or of the multitude, 
and that tactics should be, uh, that leadership should be limited to tactics. Like the first part of that, or the, well, the second part I mentioned, you know, tactical leadership, I think conceptually is not hard to understand. The idea is that, that leadership would, um, is sometimes necessary for swift responses or when spe uh, tech special technical expertise is needed, but they would be deployed and dismissed um, at, um, at, at short intervals. Um, it seems to me that, that uh, many, many would respond, I mean, many friends respond, you know, uh, that, this seems, that this seems naive to them if you give someone any leadership capacities, uh, they'll take enough. But we see many times, I think, already, and one can easily imagine tactical leadership just in every good demonstration. I mean, in every good demonstration, you need some people who are monitoring where the police are, where the demonstration needs to turn, what to do when people get arrested, how to get them out of prison. These are all, it seems to me, tactical questions um, for which some sort of uh, swift decision making and even maybe even expertise is required. There are probably much bigger examples, but I think that this isn't the real problem. The real problem is the other side of the equation what I'm calling uh, strategic movements or uh, a strategic multitude. The question there is how can we identify people's existing capacities or perhaps their uh, potential for capacities for strategic political decision making? Um, how can people decide together over the largest political issues? Like one route one could go in this, and Tony and I do some of this, but I, I think other, other, other writers or, or thinkers are probably going to be better equipped than us, is one could ask in practical terms, in terms of contemporary movements and parties, how much are they already accomplishing such a inversion? Um, in fact, I, I would say one could ask, uh, for instance, how much does a party like Podemos, or maybe better situated, the municipal government of Barcelona, already involve a kind of inversion of strategy and tactics. How much does the fallist movement in South Africa do that? How much does Niu Naminos in, in Argentina do that? I think that there are ways in which um, one could read it practically based on what people are already doing. Tony and I, for better or for worse, I think it's the kind of uh, thinkers we are, have to go a more theoretical route in the question. Um, and it might be one, uh, yeah, so I think for us, it's really, the, the issue is that we need to, in and to able to answer such a question, like is the multitude capable of strategy? Maybe that's it. You need to look beyond the political realm to the sphere of social and economic production and reproduction, and that that's where one can begin to gauge people's capacities for cooperation and hence for uh, collective political decision making. In other words, I, I guess for, for Tony and I, we, we come to a point where it seems to us that political, political questions posed as I've been posing them so far in terms of organization, even in terms of leadership, that such political questions tend to turn around in an empty way when they're not grounded in social and economic terrain. Um, so there's, so I, I wanna pr propose then, this is for the next 20 minutes. I wanna propose four concepts. Um, I wanna propose four concepts that are the, um, from our thinking through this problem. And I guess there are two sets of concepts. I'll, I'll mention them now, they're, they're concepts this is another, I'm sorry, I keep apologizing for the way Tony and I think. Um, these are concepts that we've, in many cases, which we've worked with before, and each time we seem to come back and find, well, maybe that we were wrong about them, and find ways of developing them, and that's, so the four concepts I want to propose now are uh, social production, extractivism, entrepreneurship of the multitude, the most irritating, and uh, the common. In some ways, they're really two couples, social production and, and extractivism, and then entrepreneurship of the multitude and, and the common. The first, with this uh, question of social production, um, our claim is really something like this. 
it's, it's a large claim, but I guess I, I, I need to say it in a very brief way. Our claim is that uh, economic production today is increasingly social in two senses. Um, one is that the processes of production are increasingly so, uh, social through networks of cooperation. And also, the two really go hand in hand, that the products are increasingly social. Rather than thinking of production as oriented towards only physical commodities, it's often also aimed in products that are largely immaterial, like ideas, code, information, affects, care. You know, when, when we pr propose things like that, I th people often think about uh, uh, as if one were only talking about, and, and it's even worse when, uh, you know, f close friends of mine uh, pose it in terms of cognitive production, which seems to me a mistake, and that leads people to think about, like, this is, we're just talking now about software engineers or, or people creating code. I think it's important to recognize the, um, the extent of this nature of social production and reproduction across um, across the economy from the top to the bottom. So for instance, and, and in fact adding questions of posing this in terms of affects and care in many ways helps get outside of the difficulty of thinking only in the uh, digital and informational age. Just as one example of what I mean by this social production, it's a it's a very partial example, like anyone would be, but it, it has seemed useful for me in the last couple of years to think about. Um, think of the figure of, and now I'm not sure if the translators will have to work on this, the figure of the hospice worker. So in, in, in the US, the, what, what is meant by a hospice uh, nurse, a hospice nurse is a nurse who cares for someone during the last six months of life. Uh, and so, and I, and I assume that there's a, a comparable figure, sometimes in the home and sometimes in a, in a care facility. But the hospice nurse, this particular type of nurse, is only called in during the last six months. Both of my parents died recently, so I, I sort of had a lot of experience with these hospice nurses. And they're, they're really amazing. You know, so the, these hospice nurses, of course, do many physical tasks. You know, they care for wounds, they um, deal with medication, uh, they do many physical things in that respect, but the, really the majority of the work is affective, and hence, of course, it's a highly gendered uh, form of work, highly feminized form of work, mostly women conducting the work. Um, but what they, what they do, and like, uh, of course, on the one hand, they help someone die, which is itself an enormous task, an immaterial affective task, but they also um, manage the network the network of friends of the dying person, the network of family. It's, a, it's an a incredible creation and recreation of social relations. Yeah, so think about when we say social production, think about that kind of work. Um, and it's an enormously rich ability. Like it's not immediately organizable. It's difficult because they're, they're, they're of course isolated. But I just wanted to point that there's a, um, extraordinary capacity there, and a capacity that is producing social relations. You see, that's what I wanted to get out of it as an example. Like, see, here's the, the, the theoretical claim that would go with this. Large claim about cooperation. Whereas during the industrial era, cooperation and production was largely imposed from above, in the era of social production, cooperation primarily arises from below. Like what I meant by that first half is just, I'm thinking even uh, textually, when Marx in chapter 13 of volume one talks about cooperation, cooperation is a time when the capitalist acts, he says, as a general on the battlefield or as a conductor of an orchestra, the capitalist creates and imposes cooperation on the workers, provides a place for them to work, provides the means for them to work and the materials and also the discipline for them to cooperate together. So you could see that's what I meant by in the industrial era, in the industrial paradigm, co cooperation is imposed from above. The claim here is that in the contemporary, and this is what we mean in some ways by this era of social production, is that cooperation tends to be created relatively autonomously from below. That's why I thought the hospice nurse was a good example of the kind of organization of cooperation from below. Okay, one other, uh, so I wanted then to move to this question about extractivism. 
extractivism is a term that I, I learned from Argentinians, and they were primarily thinking about extraction in a material context. You know, so the new extractivism, capital today is primarily defined by extraction, they would say, in the sense of a return to the importance of, of petroleum, of minerals. They also talk about uh, large-scale monocultural agriculture as a kind of extractivism. And what they mean by, and this is here I'm using, here's a, a short definition of what is meant by extraction here, is that capital finds free for the taking, of course, anytime you hear that term, you have to think about a colonial mentality. Capital finds free for the taking value that it merely then extracts. So the idea of pulling value from the earth in terms of petroleum, you, and the, 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 it's good to have the colonial, and they mean it in terms of a repetition of a certain colonial paradigm of silver in Potosi, or of gold in Johannesburg. I mean, that's the idea of, of the extraction. And I think this is super useful. Today's, there's been a dramatic expansion of the frontiers of extractivism, uh, new ways of extracting oil, fracking, new, new minerals, sometimes tied to digital industries, rare earth, etc., lithium, of course, for batteries. But there's also an expansion, and this is what's more important for me, or me and Tony, of the fields of biological and social wealth that are extracted. Yeah, so I would, I, I would divide, this is just conceptually because they don't often separate this easily, extractivism when one thinks about uh, the material elements of the earth, and then also the extraction of social wealth, wealth that's produced socially. So for instance, here's a, 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 a kind of bridge question, think about data mining. Like data mining already is an interesting metaphor because it's, it's appealing to an extractivist logic, you know, as if your data were simply there free for the taking and could be expropriated or accumulated as wealth. That of course gives the idea of data as something inert, whereas in fact data is already a social construction. Um, it would be what, what one should go talk more about here, but maybe just the suggestion can be enough for you to think about how the algorithms, Tony and I worked a certain amount on Google's PageRank algorithm, but all of the algorithms of social media have this extractive function. Like that's the way they accumulate wealth, by extracting the intelligence, the knowledge, the social relations of users, and like in data mining, is, is, is operating a, an analogous form of extraction to the um, traditional forms. I would say this would be another, a, a larger frontier, that finance primarily functions through extraction. You know, here's just the, 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 the brief version of that, at least the way to start, just so it might make sense to some of you who are think, thinking in these regards. You know, when, when Lenin and Hilferding talk in the early 20th century about finance, what they're primarily concerned is, is the distance, how finance is abstract from the side of production. So that, that finance capital is not physically at the point of production, it's rather abstract from it. And what finance manages to do with that at, the, at a distance is to be able to appropriate values that it was not involved in organizing the production of. Like that's, I think that it's in some ways a small step from Lenin's topographical imaginary of finance to this notion of, of extraction. Yeah, so in essential, I'm talking about wealth that is produced socially but that is extracted and accumulated privately. Now, it, it, key to this is that question of cooperation that I raised earlier, that uh, the production um, is distant from, then the cooperation in particular, is distant from the organization of capital. So what, what, I'm, what I'm hoping for is that this notion of extraction could be one way of recognizing and even revealing a social power that is relatively autonomous from the organization of capital. So why do, and also why do I care about this so much to come back to, well, I'm trying to come back to the political question now and see if this makes sense for you, which is that all of these questions about cooperation, about social cooperation, 
strongly overlap with political questions of organization. Like that the, the uh, capacity to produce, to, to produce cooperation socially is the same capacity to be able to organize politically. Okay, hope that made some sense. Let me do the other two. So uh, uh, entrepreneurship of the multitude. Uh, like I said a minute ago, this was, especially for our friends, the most irritating of the concepts we've been talking about in the last um, years. And most irritating because, um, because of the concept of entrepreneurship. I mean, because entrepreneurship has a privileged position in the neoliberal vocabulary. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it, it involves the worship of uh, heroic entrepreneurs. I don't know, Steve Jobs, et cetera, uh, the worship of the startup. But it also means, I assume some of you in a university context, like in my university, when they say entrepreneurship, it means they're taking away your funding. Um, and that's also what it means, I think, in arts communities. Because it, what it means is that, um, and I think it's more, even more generalized, uh, during the Blair government, they, uh, what they meant by social government, in the, uh, social entrepreneurship, I'm sorry, then, in the UK, was just a companion piece to neoliberal austerity. Uh, social entrepreneurship meant organizing uh, a compensation for what the state will no longer do. The state is going to close a hospital, and so now a, a Christian charity, as an, as an act of social entrepreneurship, will start a Christian uh, hospital as a kind of compensation for uh, that. I mean, even worse about entrepreneurship, I suppose, is the way the precarious are told that they need to, precarious workers are told that they need to uh, become entrepreneurs of themselves, that they need to organize their lives in a way that they can move from one job to another, continually retraining themselves. I mean, in some ways, entrepreneurship, the ideology of entrepreneurship is the cruelest ideology because it asks you to treat your precarity as if it were your salvation. In any case, we're, we're conscious of all that. Um, and yet, stubborn, I guess, as we are, we want to recapture the concept of entrepreneurship. In fact, let me, uh, it's maybe just to make, it, 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 because this might just sound perverse to you, let me just try, try to explain why, why one might want to do that. I have thought uh, one of the things that Tony and I have been doing since we started working together, and, and maybe it's what political theory can do, is that we have been trying to revitalize the crucial vocabulary of the revolutionary left that has become corrupted and unusable. And for instance, many of my friends will no longer talk about democracy because democracy has become so corrupted. Democracy just means uh, periodic elections or worse. Uh, in fact, from the US perspective, when US leaders start talking about democracy in other parts of the world, it means you better run because the bombs are gonna start falling. So if that's what democracy means, I would have, want to have nothing to do with it. But I think it's a concept worth revitalizing and struggling over because it has a, it has a whole history of struggles behind it. The same with freedom, the same with communism. Tony and I also think the same with love, but that's maybe something I shouldn't go into because it would take us too long to get to. I mean, these seem like central concepts of our political vocabulary that no longer have meaning. Entrepreneurship's different. It's, it's, this was their concept, and I think we could take it over. So anyway, that's what we're proposing. Like Entrepreneurship, at least in my knowledge, was never a leftist revolutionary concept. It, instead, I think though we can make use of it. So here's, here's what it would mean to make use of it, I think. I, Tony and I even start with Schumpeter, you know, because Schumpeter, what he says about entrepreneurship is uh, a it, very simple definition in a way. Uh, sh uh, entrepreneurship involves the creation of new combinations. That's Schumpeter's term. Um, by which he means bringing together workers, resources, processes. That's, those are new combinations, what the entrepreneur does. For us, that sounds very similar to the notion of cooperation in Marx. Uh, this, the, the, the kind of bringing together. So what we think of it is, is a capacity to organize co productive cooperation autonomously. Like that would be the entrepreneurship of the multitude. Um, it would, so it involved capacities for self-organization and self-management, but also antagonistic action against the system that creates that inequality. That's what, so a variety of 
experiments in self-management or mutualistic experiments seem to us to fit into that category. For instance, uh, one of the ones that we've been inspired by for many years is the PA in Spain, the P-A-H, the platform for those affected by mortgages, hipotecas, um, which started as an anti-eviction campaign uh, during the economic crisis, but also then developed into a political project uh, for housing, occupying housing, a political project more generally for gentrification and debt, and also, good, 10 minutes, um, uh, also then fed into the electoral project of the government of Barcelona. That seemed to us an example of entrepreneurship. Okay, let me give you two more examples of entrepreneurship. And I, to do that, I need to just say something about what we mean by the common because they have to do with that. And I hope they'll make sense. Um, so by the common, and, and I do think that this notion of the common is the guiding thread through many examples today of what we're trying to recognize as entrepreneurship of the multitude. Okay, so by the common, we mean simply that which is not property. And if we were to think of property, now here, um, in perhaps overly simplistic terms, if we were to think about property as being defined by the limiting of access and the monopoly over decision making, the common involves open access and democratic forms of decision making. You could think of it as shared social wealth, but what's shared social wealth that's managed collectively like that part seems crucial to me, the question about management. In any case, the, you know, the, 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 the call for the abolition of property could to many, but maybe not you all in this room, uh, which would be nice, but the abolition of private property could seem like an unrealistic 19th century dream, but I think that even when people are not using that term, abolition of private property, it's increasingly becoming a real demand in social movements. So let me just give you two examples that I think bring together this question of the common and the, um, and the abolition of private property. One example, which goes well beyond what I'm making use of it here, is the, are the, um, the Dakota Access Pipeline protests at Standing Rock, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, on the, on the, uh, the protests about a, uh, an oil pipeline going through the uh, Indian Reservation in, uh, in the Dakotas, in, um, in the United States, the Sioux tribe. And what um, interested me about this, I mean, there are many very interesting things about, the, important things about the protest, uh, like for instance, the historic gathering of North American tribes on the one hand, secondly, the ways that environmentalists in the US took the lead from Native American groups, which I think was also very important. But the one I wanted to focus on was the relationship to property, because the protests were not organized around property claims. One could organize, and many do organize, um, uh, protests against pipelines uh, in, 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 in terms of property. For instance, it's our property and therefore it would be a destruction of our property or a risk of a destruction of our property to do this. The leaders of Standing Rock did not argue that way. What they said instead was, um, what we have to develop is a new relationship to the earth, a different relationship to the earth, which involves collective care. Like that's their way of saying it, collective responsibility and collective care. This, it, it, the, this notion of the common, they don't use the term the common, but I think it's primarily the same thing. In other words, re regarding the earth not as property but as common, that's what I think this collective care and responsibility is pointing towards. Um, seems to me it probably goes well beyond what Tony and I imagine or have been able to think the common, but it's a kind of entrepreneurship organized around the common. That's what I wanted to get. One, one, one other one, I think I'm down to five minutes now. Um, that's okay, it helps me. Um, another, another US example uh, is uh, a group that fits under the broad umbrella of Black Lives Matter in the US, but, but there are many varied things that fit under that umbrella. Um, this group is in Oakland, California. It's called the Black Land and Liberation Initiative. Um, and it was uh, launched last June, um, a date in June that's called Juneteenth. It's the it's the anniversary of the emancipation. 
of slaves in the US. And they launched a project for the reappropriation of social wealth, of land and other forms of social wealth. And let me read to you part of their, um, their manifesto because I think it touches on these questions about, brings together the common extraction and this entrepreneurship. Yeah, so they say, our aim is to develop diverse and independent strategies that move us away from the current extractive economy, which depends on the violent enclosure of land, culture, power, wealth, and spirit. We're asserting the fundamental right to the resources required to create our own productive, dignified, and sustainable livelihoods through our free labor and self-governance. Okay, so um, what I'm interested in here is the way it's not arguing for a restitution of land or even a restitution of property. This is essentially a reparations argument in a long tradition of demands of reparations. In fact, the Standing Rock protest could easily be argued around reparations also. But it's not a reparation saying that you need to return the property that was stolen. I think it's much more radical than that because what's being returned is not being returned as property, but rather as common. That's what, uh, that's what it seems to me. So that both the, you know, the, the occupation of lands that they're, that they're um, advocating, the occupation also of housing, of, of urban spaces is, um, right, is a advocacy, even if they're not putting it this way, let's see, it's a critique of the extractive economy on the one hand, but it's also an advocacy of the common and not a property. Um, yeah, think of this as a reparations, not in terms of theft, because the question of theft would be one about rightful ownership but rather as the injustice of property itself, of extraction, of ex enclosure, and therefore the need for the common. Yeah, so if, if some of you appeals to you, in some ways, even though they're not citing this, it's very much like Marx's critique of Proudhon. Like, so you remember the, the brief rather, um, what you say, uh, ungenerous, let's say, Marx's critique of, of uh, uh, Proudhon's book, uh, Property is Theft, where he says, yes, of course, uh, that's right, but in order to call property theft, you have to still be thinking in the mentality of private property. What we need to be able to do, and is a much more radical project, and that's what I think both of these examples I gave are involved with, is thinking about it no longer in terms of property, and hence theft is probably no longer the right term, um, but rather of a kind of restitution or reparations that would uh, go beyond that. Okay, so the, what I wanted to say, just to stop. I, so, on the one hand, what I, what I, the, the, the somewhat rhetorical question that Tony and I posed at the very beginning, you know, that I uh, about where have all the leaders gone? That's not really the right question, and perhaps you thought at the very point it wasn't. The inversion that we're proposing involves a different question. Um, you could say, on the one hand, how do we limit leadership to tactics? But the more important question is, where can people find the power and capacity to organize and decide together in a sustained way over our political future? How can the multitude become capable of strategy? That seems to us the most um, important question. So just as a, as a coda, I mentioned to you that I, I had, I had, uh, I've been having a number of discussions that was in partly around this um, the book in the, in the U.S. And one of the responses that's, that was useful for me, I thought, was someone that said afterwards um, that, um, that he said, you know, 15 years ago when I read Empire, I was really identifying with you and Tony, me and Tony, in other words, and, um, and identifying with our optimism because that was a moment that seemed full of potential. Um, but that today, he was saying, that doesn't, uh, he no longer sees that potential and so it's difficult to follow us. It seems to me that today, given the right wing threats of various sorts, there's a, there is of course an important need for protest and resistance, but it might seem as if 
because of those right-wing threats, it might seem that this is a moment to, to tame our dreams, uh, to limit our dreams, and to defend what we have, to aim at incremental gains. And one should pose then the question, how to organize against the right? Like that's what seems uh, involved, what seems to be pressing. I would argue instead that now is the time really to think big, to imagine the world that we really want. In fact, one of the dangers of focusing on protest and resistance um, is that we might end up stumbling merely from one disaster to another, from one outrage to another. I, I had recognized this in Turkey already in 2013 and after 2016 is certainly more so. And then with Trump's election last year, I find that many on the left in the US, while admirably and necessarily focusing on resistance, I, there's a, a continual operation of defensive maneuvers and thinking only in a, um, in a reaction, in a reaction to the very real, in that reaction to the very real out, outrages. But if one's always on the defensive um, and only um, thinking in terms of resistance, one doesn't have the moment which seems to be important to construct. It seems to me, in fact, that people today have an appetite for imagining a different world, for thinking big. And in fact, that we have the means to bring it about. That's what Tony and I are, in fact, trying to, um, to, to, to test, to gauge. And in fact, that, that thinking about our real alternatives, about constructing actually a different world, it seems to me that's the only reasonable and realistic way to go forward. That's where I stop. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, as we will all be aware, this is again an incredible tour de force an incredible range of uh, different camps of not just the history of philosophy, but also of current movements. Before I start giving out the possibility to you on the floor, I would like to get back to this, in my understanding, very crucial point about the question of organizing, as you put it, or as institutionalization. I think uh, the, this question has been a central tenet for all kinds of anti-systemic movements that have sprung up since, say, the beginning of capitalism, uh, to uh, the question of how to organize their resistance. And we have found in the history of the labor movement, specifically since the early 19th century onwards, different um, answers which were masked specifically in the opposition between, later on, Marxism, anarchism, um, both focusing on the elimination of the state, but with quite different means at the end of the day. And the question for me, to put it short and not to uh, elaborate too long, here would be, what is, if we speak about hope, if we speak about an optimism that you see, what is the optimism that you give current or future movements uh, in the possibility of institutionalizing yet not becoming again institution? How can they keep alive these instincts, these thrusts that move them in the first instance without ever reneging on what they actually want to achieve in the, in the long term. This would, for me, constitute a crucial question to the political edge that is embedded in assembly. You know, Mike, you could just go ahead, actually. Okay. Um, so, let's just start. Any immediate additional questions on Michael's presentation. There's somebody in the back. Do, do we have a mic going up there, or does somebody? How's that organized? Nobody's around. <laughs> could could you come to the front and? Oh. Well, you, you could, uh, 
Can see number bit of men or just hands up please. Who was there? Yeah. Not my men. So thank you uh, very much for your presentation. My name is Jorge. Um, I would like to ask you uh, regarding your first concept of social uh, production. And uh, with the example that you gave, uh, I had the impression that you are kind of eliminating this distinction between uh, social production and social reproduction. So I would like to uh, ask you why, why you are doing so, and if it's not um, more what you are losing, uh, 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 eliminating that distinction that you are getting with it. Social production and social reproduction, which is a concept that uh, the, the one of social reproduction is strongly present in the uh, feminist uh, Marxist uh, discussions. Hi, I'm Michelle Williams, Bits University, South Africa. Um, so just two questions. One is I don't feel like you've answered the question of what happened, why were those movements not successful? You started off by talking about the post-2010 movements. Why weren't they successful? You jumped to the leadership issue, but those movements were characterized by this kind of non-leadership that you were talking about. Secondly, if there's been an internal critique of charismatic leaders, how do we explain the rise of right-wing charismatic leaders? And they capture exactly, exactly these populations that we're talking about in the multitudes. Um, and even, I mean, and you, you mentioned the fees must fall in South Africa. There were incredible <laughs> charismatic leaders who took control but had no accountability. So how can you, um, explain the rise of those kind of leaders. Ich würde vorschlagen, wir nehmen noch eine Frage von Alex und machen dann danach die nächste Runde. Uh, okay. Darf ich auf Deutsch stellen? Ja. Ähm, mich würde reflexiv interessieren, wie du The interpreters what which which number do we have to Ja, mich würde interessieren die Frage nach der Leadership. Ja, in, in eine, als eine reflexive Frage auf die Rolle, die Michael und Toni selber in den Bewegungen spielen. Weil, ja, weil das ist ja eine interessante Frage, wenn er sagt strategische Multitude und taktisches Leadership. Aber dann gibt es ja eine Reihe von Intellektuellen, die in einer gewissen Weise eine globale Führungs- und Sprecherposition haben. Und die Frage ist, ob die, weil ich sehe das mit der Führung nicht so optimistisch wie er, denn das könnte sein, dass es eben auch Ergebnis einer sehr durchdringenden Repression ist und nicht nur eine demokratische Reaktion aus den sozialen Bewegungen. Und dann stellt sich die Frage, wie eigentlich ist Leadership oder Führung auf dieser, auf dieser Ebene organisiert und was fehlt, wenn sie nicht existiert. Ja, weil das ist ja genau das, was die Kollegin sagt, dass nämlich die Bewegung ja dann doch eben immer wieder sehr schnell abbrechen und keine Kontinuität gewinnen. I think maybe I could combine something that Lars and Alex and, and maybe Michelle are um, are pointing towards. One of the things, there's another thing that Alex said that I'll come back to, um, which is about um, what I was trying at the beginning and, and, and I think didn't express clearly enough, um, how should I say it, that we, uh, let's see. I think one of the things conceptually we have to work through is a seeming alternative. Like what I posed at the beginning was a seeming alternative between either uh, a pure hor horizontality or a return to centralized forms of leadership and institutionalization. 
What, what I think, um, and this is also then, then when, when Michelle asked, well, if these movements were uh, critical of leadership, why did, they, why did they fail? I think that um, what, I think one, one place to start thinking about that, this is not really an answer, is that um, part of the problem, or it is a problem, I'm not going to say that this is a general diagnosis. It is a problem when the refusal of leadership uh, becomes confused with a refusal of organization or a refusal of institution. So that what, one thing that has to be developed, and perhaps in some ways is being developed, if perhaps not enough, as, is no uh, forms of institutionalization that are, so what Tony and I call it in here, what we're trying to think through is non-sovereign institutions. But really what, what, what we mean is that there's a need for institutionalization, but that has to be organized in, in, in new, and you could say democratic forms, although that's a difficult, that's already something that has to be worked through. So, so I guess with, um, I think one thing that, in, it, at least if I'm understanding you, Michelle, when you're asking that is that, it's not that I, I, I think that the, um, that the movements as they are today are uh, the model to be pursued. Or maybe I'll put it even another way. A, 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 a close friend of mine who, who keeps, she keeps, uh, she keeps insisting, well, we're winning, we're winning. I said, no, we're not winning. Like that's the problem is that we keep losing. Um, and I, I think losing, it's not bad that we suffer defeats, I mean, Communist movements have always suffered defeats. The point is to, to rather that there has to be um, a transformation of it, and, and a, specifically a transformation in the in the direction of an inst of an alternative institutionalization. Maybe that's too 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 broad a question for you, Lars, to to ask this or um, a, a focus on organization. In fact, what what the critique of leadership must require is an added focus on organization. Okay, here's, here's another way of approaching it that, that I think also one thing that Lars is thinking of, which is, here too is another experimental proposition, you know, field of thinking about it. When Tony and I try to work through what today would be, could be meant by social unionism, a concept that has a, a US tradition, a UK tradition, a South African tradition that's even uh, deeper. Um, and what we're thinking about is ways in which of a, of a, um, of a hybrid between uh, syndicalist structures and social movement structures. Um, partly because of uh, the need to organize labor differently uh, to contribute the antagonistic character of social movements, but also the um, uh, is stability and continuity um, and um, yeah, a, a, a internal structures and abilities of, of the syndicalist traditions. So thinking about that as, like I say, it's not an answer. It's rather a terrain of thinking of what, uh, and so in fact, our, the sequence that we try to think is social production leads to social unionism, which leads to social strike. And so the one has to think, in fact, uh, what strike means differently. Okay, I have a reference for that, but that might not be helpful. Um, at the moment, the requ reflexive question, oh, maybe I should say something about social production, re reproduction. I, I mean, I, I think, I, I'm not quite sure in the sense that you're asking it, but the, um, it had been foundational for me, you know, from US and UK Marxist feminist traditions from the 1980s to always supplement thought about capitalist production with questions of reproduction, or rather to take the standpoint of reproduction, which doesn't, which, which can involve, I think, destabilizing, perhaps not removing, but destabilizing the division that one thinks between production and reproduction. Like that's what, um, and that that, it seems to me an important standpoint. That's why that's where I would start with it. I guess I wasn't sure if that was if that's capturing what the sense of the question was. You know about the reflexive um, reflexive question about me and Tony. I I do think I'm not sure if this is the sense in which you're thinking about it. 
You know, but thinking about 68 could be a good, you know, the 50th anniversary could be a way of uh, doing this. I, in thinking about this question about leaders and leadership, it did, for me, lead to questions about the so-called public intellectuals or the notion of pub being a public intellectual. I hate the public intellectuals. Like, I hate the idea. It's not that I think that intellectuals should stay in the university and say nothing else, what, but what I think is often meant by public intellectual is someone who's claiming a leadership in thought, like who's claiming a position of, of being able to dictate. So that I, I, it seems to me something that should be avoided. Um, and I would hope that Tony and I would manage to do that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think what it is, is, I mean, I think what should be done uh, is, well, I guess we should stop, uh, I mean, why don't I take another step back? Maybe say, let me say two things that, that probably seem like, you know, taken for granted things, which is, one has to start by disrupting any notion of a division between theory and practice, whereby intellectuals, whomever they are, whoever they are, are the ones who do theory and that activists do practice. Instead, I think the most important and productive theorizing goes on in movements. And so one has to think about sometimes the relationship between professional intellectuals and the kind of theorizing they do and the kind of theorizing that goes on collectively in movements. That's where I think the, the real advances happen. And so I think the role of, of, I think the role of us, I mean, I think us, is to operate a kind of co-research, a kind of working with and learning from the kind of theorizing that goes, to, that, that goes on in movements. So at least that's, that's, way I, that's way I would want to destabilize uh, a question about, um, about the role of public intellectuals and, and also then the reflexive question that you were posing. Does that not? Yeah, yeah, please go on. Yeah. 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 Maybe I misunderstood what you were getting at. No, the answer is good, but I don't teile it. I don't teile it. That's why I have another comment, because I think that is a very central strategic question. Du hast angefangen mit der Frage, wo sind die Leute wie Dutschke? Wo sind die alle? Ja, und jetzt kann man natürlich sagen, wenn Leute wie Michael Hart und Toni Negri und so weiter die Rolle von organischen Spokepersons verweigern, weil sie sagen, sie wollen keine Public Intellectuals sein, dann finde ich gut, kein Public Intellectual zu sein, weil das ist eine liberale Figur. Aber ein organischer Spokesperson zu sein in einer strategischen Situation der Organisation einer globalen Linken, das ist kein Public Intellectual, kein professioneller Intellektueller, sondern das ist ein Organisator in einem Prozess der Linken und der sozialen Bewegung. Und diese Rolle zu verweigern, ja, das ist möglicherweise selber eine Vermeidung der Verantwortung. Und das ist nicht, nicht persönlich gemeint. It's, it's not a personal critique, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of the role of left intellect. Entschuldigung, der Wechsel der Sprache. Die, die, die Rolle von, von, ja, von Leuten, die aus den Bewegungen heraus diese Funktion des Sprechens ja, erlangen und übernehmen und dann auch in weiträumig vernetzt sind. Das ist ja nicht nur eine Frage intellektueller Kompetenz, sondern auch einer Vernetzung von Kontakten, von Bezügen, von Wissen. Ja. So the question will surely be retaken once. Uh, Michael has come up with it. I suggest we gather another three or four questions, uh, please. I've, it's difficult. I've seen a hand going up there, and there's about three hands up there. 
And I would close for this round, and please remember, I should think we get down to one other round. Uh, no, there was down here, the, the comrade down here, please. And please be short for the others to Thank you very much for Thanks. your talk. Uh, I have one question on how you describe strategic planning and your proposed inversion of strategy and tactics. So when you describe strategic planning, I would say you missed one essential part, and that's why I think your framework is not working in a way that we need it for social movements, and that is the question. Strategy also defines the budget, setting the, it's not just setting the goals, it's setting the budget. It's defining and allocating the resources, and it's doing, then doing the action planning. And the inversion that you described was mostly on the goals, on the aims of social movements, but I think the political question is how do we set the budgets, how do we allocate the resources, and then, then the inversion doesn't work in a way that I have at least as I have understood in that talk. And I mean, that brings us a little bit back to the question that you were also dealing with, that's the question of organizational theory. And there, I mean, of course, we have different models from autocracy to matrix structure to network to rhizomatic structures. And I think maybe we should think of, of, of other forms that are dealing with that and to apply them to social movements. Yeah, I, I mean, let's say the the, the the inversion that you describe for social movements and the, the relationship between um, tactics and strategy. So if we could think of, let's say, Im imagine like the rhizomatic figure of Deleuze and Guattari also describes a form of the, the nucleus is centralized in a way, but it's also decentralized. And I mean, of course, we need somehow to find forms for um, strategic planning with uh, decentralized budgeting. And I think in management theory, for example, there are solutions, autocracy, and so that, that could be a, a way to deal with this. Uh, hi. Um, my question is that, uh, I mean, somewhat like Michelle asked about why movements have failed. Why movements have failed, oppositional movements have failed. One could put the other way around that why capitalism has been successful. What, it's what why capitalism has been successful. Yes. It's, it's the same question being asked in a different way. And wouldn't it be sort of more honest to sort of admit that we have underplayed the strengths of capitalism? Um, that Capitalism has enormous amount of strengths and flexibility and adaptability. And, and, and I mean, of course, uh, uh, Gramsci talked about it, about the hegemony, and, and, and two kinds of hegemony, about the repressive hegemony and the ideological hegemony. I'm saying it's beyond the ideological hegemony. It's about the kind of questions which capitalism raises, which we did not think are important. I'll just give you one example from England where I live. It's housing, for example. The, 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 the Marxist left or the non-Marxist left have not really thought seriously about why people want to have a house. And Margaret Thatcher just got into that idea. People need some kind of security. They want to have a house. And she totally wiped out the entire left and Thatcherism then took over even the Labour Party. And, and, and so the, the, the question would be, along with recognizing the strengths of capitalism, one need to think about the vulnerabilities of capitalism. And those vulnerabilities are not merely in terms of structural vulnerabilities, that capitalism is under crisis, that it leads to you know, decline in the rate of profit and, and it leads to crisis and so on and so forth. Not, not, not that, deeper, deeper sense of vulnerabilities which people can conceptualize, people can actually see those vulnerabilities. And, and because if we don't recognize and keep on focusing only on organization and, and uh, it looks very Leninist, voluntaristic kind of thing. It's only a question of determination. If we are strong enough, we keep on fighting, we will win. I think there are other deeper forces which lead to the fall of movements and, and, and the continuation of capitalism. <coughs> Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. My question is a follow-up on the question of uh, public intellectuals with this uh, organic uh, intellectuals. Um, uh, since maybe the 1980s, maybe uh, before that, there's a deep divide in the left between activists and intellectuals that seems not to be, uh, that we just can't bridge it. Uh, accidentally. So my question maybe to both of you in a, kind of in a way, 
would be um, how you want to deal with uh, that problem because it seems not only to be about taking responsibility or not but uh, about a deeper division uh, within the left um, that speaks maybe uh, to the question if we uh, still have a common goal um, where we can have in the framework of that of that goal, of that uh, general idea, where we can have uh, uh, debates about strategy and tactics that seem only to uh, to matter or to be possible if there is uh, a uh, orientation to something um, and 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 a, and a measurement uh, where really uh, these debates can uh, can take place. Otherwise, people like you said uh, can continue to uh, either say we're winning. Oh, we're losing, but the question is, what are we fighting about? I think. So, yeah. One more, no? Shall we check one more? Sure. What? Okay. One more? Yeah. One more. Can we check one more? Hi, thank you. I, th I think my question is a follow up as well. Um, I would like to know um, how you characterize the nature of the movements to point it to, because um, when you talk about the movements without specifying their nature, it sounds as if their content was interchangeable. But when talking about the entrepreneurship of the multitude, you talked about organizing work autonomously. And when speaking about commons, you talked about open access, democratic decision making and transparent distribution. So I guess my question is, do you or where do you locate the question of um, the, social, the social question as it is? Um, and connected with that, when aiming at revitalizing the traditional corrupted vocabulary, Why not call it by its name, by its names, workers' self-control over the protection, planned economy, or democratic socialism? Thanks. I think, I mean, I, I think I have to, uh, I, I, I apologize in advance for this. I think with the first two questions, I have to um, agree with the questioners. Um, this is always my problem, though, I realize. I, whenever someone says something, I always think that they're right at first. And then eventually I come back to, you know, thinking something different. But, but I, I think... Uh, I mean, I think th with the first question, at least the part that I'm, and if I'm understanding this correctly, that, that part of this question of the inversion is not, as you were saying, just about um, uh, strategic goals and continuity in that way, but also about the daily infrastructures of organizing and movements themselves. That's the way I'm interpreting the budget question um, and, and resources. I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. Um, I mean, I think that that, that there. This is partly one with. I, I'm. I also was a, a agreeing with Lars, pose, at least in part of what you're saying. And I'm agreeing with other parts too. But in the part of putting the ac accent on institutions, and, and institutionalization, you know, I think that that is what. Um, one thing that's one thing that's uh, difficult to maintain, and and also then to create institu institutions differently. Rather than, I mean, because I'm not saying we need to, in some ways, reconstitute the institutions that the left had in some, in some traditional sense, but that they have to be remade. But it has to be remade in a way that do accomplish those tasks that you're talking about, the elements of infrastructure. I, I know there's more to what you're saying, but let me also go on to the, to the second one, which is um, I, I definitely agree with you that we have to ask why has capital been successful? Um, and I don't, but the, and, and I mean, I don't see why there's an alternative and you, I don't think you were, you were just posing this rhetorically because one can of course have to ask both why have the movements failed and why has capital been successful? I mean, both of them seem to be important endeavors. Um, that though, I don't know if this is a way of, uh, of, of responding to that at all. I, I, um, I, I've, for the last uh, 25 years, every spring taught a course to uh, young students at University on Marx. 
And, and one of the students this year, I thought it was an interesting thing when he said after a class, he says, I understand now you're an accomplishments of the capitalist era communist. Like that was he, the term he invented from reading, like understanding that the, you know, that the kind of thing that you could see in the manifesto, but you know, throughout Marx's work where it's important to recognize the accomplishments of the, of the capitalist era in part because capital provides weapons for the construction of something different. You know, so that rather than, I mean, at least this is, the, the student was posing, it seemed to me quite reasonable as, this is one variety of communist, is a accomplishments of the capitalist era communist. There could be other varieties of communists he was thinking that, that, that think of their anti-capitalism in a much more, uh, what should we call it, uh, refusal of all that capital has produced way. So anyway, I, I would try to, to steer your question about why has capital been successful or recognizing uh, various successes of, of, of the capitalist era, not that we should, of course, and this isn't what you intend, that we should somehow decide, oh, well, it turns out capital wasn't so bad after all, but rather think about the ways in which capitalist development provides mechanisms or weapons for being able to create something different. I don't know, it, it, I'm not sure if that's possible in terms of the housing thing, but that's where I would try to go um, with this. I totally uh, agree with, at least in my own experience about the question about activists and intellectuals, I, or rather, you know, so one of my um, laments as a 20 year old in the US in the 1980s was that th there was a kind of anti-intellectualism in the movements, at least the movements that I belonged to. And so I felt like I had to have a kind of divided life where I had a scholarly life, you know, things I was interested in intellectually, and then there was an activist life, which would seem to be not only uninterested, but actually completely refusing the kinds of intellectual endeavors. I have found in the last, of, you know, in a, in a, in a younger generation, I, I don't know, the, the, at least the generation of, of um, like in the US, it might have even started with ACT UP or you know, some groups in the 90s, but certainly by the 2000s and in the last you know, 15 years or so, I haven't, I, it seems to me there's less of a divide between the intellectual interests and the activism, like a, a much more of a, of, a, of a proximity between them. Yeah, so like my own role isn't what's, I, I, at least that's what, uh, maybe I got off on the wrong foot when in trying to respond to Alex's question. What interests me much more are the kinds of um, intellectual work that can be done in activist contexts. And maybe it is being done already. And that's, what, that's where I would at least start with it. Um, locate the social. I do, you know, so, um, You know, with the, 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 last, the last point was, you know, both, I, uh, on the one hand, I was starting to agree, um, you know, in, the, in that recognition that we have to rely and think in the terrain of the social. And, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be against reanimating the concepts or slogans that you mentioned, but I wouldn't want to adopt them without questioning them. Maybe that's where I, I would be. I don't know if that makes sense as a response, and maybe that's exactly what you were thinking too. But so, um, yeah, so for instance, I, I, this was, I, I thought it was very useful, uh, 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 a discussion I had in, 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 in Leipzig some after the, uh, Commonwealth was published, and someone in the audience said, well, when you're talking about the common, it sounds to me like uh, the forms of state property that we had um, in the German Democratic Republic. And I, and I thought, well, I, so I tried to make the distinction, at least in my own mind, you know, with, with, the, with the person who asked the question, between um, what um, state property involves and something different than the common. But it seems to, like I'm, I'm happy to think that there is a stream within the those traditions that that could 
that could lead to this. I just wouldn't want to um, um, adopt the terminology as if it's treating us directly within or const constraining us directly to the ways that those concepts had been used previously. Okay, I realize that I'm becoming less and less coherent and I thought that you were just gesturing that that might be a moment. Did you have a, another set of questions? Or we, should we? Uh, I'll, I'll get on to you, yeah, okay. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Are you? Yeah. So we've, we've now formally come to the end of the announced pitch. Um, I had said before that uh, that we would give another round, but I suggest giving uh, and seeing the uh, democracy at work here in the room, yes. which decides self -autonomous me, to, uh, in self-autonomy about the end of this meeting. Again, a very heartful thanks to Michael Hart. A thorough thanks to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation that continuously does present stimulating uh, events as such. And last but not least, of course, a very uh, strong round of applause to Max and Felix, the interpreters tonight, please. Thank you very much.